Welcome to AP Statistics. I am not affiliated with the College Board. I teach at the world-famous Melvin J. Berman Hebrew Academy, where I'm known as Dr. Kling. And this is Lesson 1, Quantitative Data. We're going to try to talk about three types of data, ultimately. Today we're going to talk about quantitative data. And here's an example. This is uh, my Fantasy Baseball League. And these are the scores of various owners. Like the top owner has right now has 101 points. Um, I have 45 points. A higher score is a better score, so I'm not doing so well in this league. All right, so that's an example of quantitative data. I have another term for quantitative data that I, I use, or a couple other terms. One. I, I, term I like to use is continuous data. Continuous because you can have values in a range and you can have you know, values up to decimal points and things like that. With continuous data any number can fit. You can even have fractions it won't hurt a bit. Well, that was Arlo um, my evil twin. We'll try to keep him out of things here. But um, that's so I call it continuous, so you can have uh, s just like the real numbers, an infinite number of possible values. And then another term that I'll use for it is, I'll put it here, scalar data. Scalar data, because you can imagine data being put along a scale with the high numbers here, so very high numbers, let's say 100, and low numbers here, 0, something like that. So that's scalar data. You can scale it in inches, or seconds, or pounds. Or Arlo, okay, that's enough. We, we won't have him come back. Uh, we're done with him. Okay, so we, have, so we call it quantitative data, continuous data, scalar data, and you can, it's stuff that you can measure on a scale. And what I want to talk about is some of the things that you can do with quantitative data that you can't do with other kinds of data. So the first thing we'll talk about is correlation. So we can imagine a scatter plot where we have on this axis we have this year's fantasy baseball uh, score, number of points, and that can range from a low of 12 to a high of uh, about 130 or something like that. Um, and so, and then I'll measure it against last year's. So the same owners, how did they do last year and this year? So somebody who did really well last year. Let's put the, let's say the 130 here, 12 here. So somebody who did really well last year and th well this year would be up here. Somebody who did really poorly both years would be down here. Somebody who did well last year but not so well this year would be down here. And somebody who did not so well last year but did really well this year would be up here. And so if the points looked something like this, and the line of best fit was upward sloping, we would say that the, there is positive correlation. So there would be positive correlation, correlation between last year's standings and this year's standings. On the other hand, you can imagine something like this, where again we have this year and last year, and the points are sort of more kind of random. No particular pattern, and the line of best fit is pretty much horizontal, and that's no correlation. 
And I would say if we had this situation, positive correlation, that's a sign that there's some skill involved in this fantasy baseball, that the people who uh, are good one year tend to be good the next, that's a sign that there's skill, whereas if you had this pattern, that would be a sign that there's luck. And I think in our league, there's a, a generally a pattern that shows some skill. These, uh, the, the, good player, the good owners have a good f better feel than the rest of us for who's going to have a good year and who's not going to have a good year. And so uh, I think there's more positive correlation. You might ask what would happen with downward sloping line, you know, negative correlation. And I think it's hard to imagine that happening. I guess maybe if, if we had a handicap system where the, if you did well last year, or if you did poorly last year, you got to have uh, better draft choices uh, next year. That, a, a handicap system like that might lead to negative correlation. But basically, uh, in this instance, I'm interested in positive versus zero. And the point is, with quantitative data, you can get correlation. Another thing that you can get with quantitative data is variance. So you can measure something called variance. So in our league, the average amount that you pay for a player, we bid at our auction, is about $1.40. And the, I think the most a player has ever gone for was close to six dollars, and then the least a player can go for is ten cents. And there, are, you can imagine a couple of approaches to this. You could have, let's put, let's say, let's put three there. We'll put one there. So one, two, three. I should have made the scale a little better, but uh, in any case. The, uh, there, you could try to get a lot of star players, and so you could maybe get up to seven or eight players in this, uh, in this area, but that would force you to take mostly scrub players for the rest of your team. So you would have about uh, 10 or 15 players who are in the scrub area. So this would be a high variance approach to having the team. And then a lower variance approach would be to go for depth rather than stars. And so you might have, again, we'll put uh, two over here, we'll put one over here. You might get most of your players in this range, and then only a few here, and maybe one or n maybe even none over here. And that would be a low variance. So you would have most of the uh, players kind of in the middle, few at the ends. That would be low variance. So I'll call that low variance. Versus the stars and scrub strategy with very few players in the middle. And I'll call that high variance. And again, it's not important as with correlation to get the whole concept of variance down. I'm just saying that that's one of the things we can do with continuous data that we cannot do with other data. We can talk about variance. And the last thing I want to talk about is skewness. Oop, go back. Skewness. So the distribution of the value of baseball players is skewed to the right. And I'll show that in a second. Uh, it's especially true for pitchers. So uh, if you look at the actual values, not the fantasy values, the actual values of pitchers, let's have a scale, let's say, of 0 million, 1, oh, no, let's make that 5, 10, 15. I think, so these are annual salaries for pitchers, 0 million, five, ten, fifteen. I think the minimum salary for a pitcher, uh, for a baseball player, is somewhere around half a million or three hundred thousand. I'm not sure what it is, but something somewhere around there. And I think the biggest one-year salary for a pitcher is usually like around fifteen million dollars a year. I may, I may have that wrong too, but that's, let's work with that. Now the distribution of, of pitchers, I think you would find that uh, up to about a quarter of pitchers are worth 
only only about a million dollars a year or less and then you get another quarter that might take you up to I don't know three or four million and so that takes you to half the pictures let me put a box there actually let me pause a second I didn't like that okay I didn't like that line in the middle I wanna okay so I'm gonna take the second 25 percent up to the middle up to let's say about three or four million dollars and then the third so the next 25 percent I'll take up to let's say uh, about eight million might, might not even go that high and then the top 25 percent you kinda of get above that but you get some real outliers uh, in out here so, so this, these are the superstar pictures so this is a picture of a distribution that's skewed to the right and w one of the things about skewed to the right is that the mean is much much greater than the median the median is shown here that's the up to fifty percent and this is the next 25% and then the top 25% is scattered all the way through here. The mean is much greater than the median. So take for example the Washington Nationals where they've got a pitching staff that's mostly consists of pitchers who are in this in this area here. Uh, not very valuable pitchers. But they've signed a phenom named uh, Steven Strasburg who they're expecting to be out here. Well, you, when you add Strasburg to their pitching staff, you're going to raise the mean salary or the mean value of their pitching staff by quite a bit. You might more than double it. But the median can only move by one. So if they have ten pitchers, the median just moves over just a little bit. So the, so the single player Strasburg has a much bigger effect on the mean than on the median and when the mean is much greater than the median it's skewed to the right so again the the important thing here is that there are three things that you can do with quantitative data that you can't do with other data you can d say something about correlation you can say something about variance and you can say something about skewness and that's it we're going to talk about the other two data types in our next lecture see you then